Hey there, my discipleship friends. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed my day, and uh, it was great to have a, a potluck at our church and get, to get a chance to sit down together and, and just fellowship with one another. I enjoy those opportunities. But now we have another opportunity to look at God's Word, and today the, the passage that I wanted to highlight is Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it, is also, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth." So I'm, I'm titling this journal entry, The Whole World is Bearing Fruit. Um, <clears throat> and we, as we do, you know, using the here journal method, uh, first we highlight what's the passage we're looking at and then explain what does this mean in its original context. And, and um, so when we think of who was it, to whom was it originally written, uh, the, it's the church in Colossae where Paul had never visited before. And, and I pulled this, this next description from reformedanswers.org and just as a way to, to show you that you know there are great free resources out there on the internet where you're like, I, I have no idea who, who this, this letter was originally, originally written to. Well, there's great resources online and reformedanswers.org, I've found that they, they give great, um, they, they give they give introductions to books of the Bible that I think are a great balance between um, details that have real substance to it, but also it's it's brief. It's not you don't have to read like twenty pages on on archaeological stuff that it goes above your head. So that's a great resource for you to look at. But this is how they introduce it. They say the Colossian epistle addressed Christians who had come under the influence of a false teaching that mixed elements of Greek philosophy with Judaism. So we don't see that particularly coming up much in, in this passage, but we'll see more of this later on. Uh, but how does this fit in with the verses before and after it? Well, we see that Paul is encouraged to see that the church is growing in places that he had never been to, uh, that he did not have to be the one who made the church work. It's not his church. He's just serving Christ in his church. And so Paul, being encouraged, wants to then now encourage these Christians uh, through his letters. Why did the Holy Spirit include this passage in the book? Well, the gospel of Jesus is intended to go out into all the world. You see, that is that is the scope of God's plan. And it's working. The Holy Spirit is working. And the gospel is spreading to the world. And it was spreading to the known parts of the world in that day. And, and Paul was excited about that. And another thing that, that we take away from this is, is the value of rejoicing in the good news of other people. When other churches do well, praise God. That's awesome. You know, there's a temptation for, for churches to have a sense of rivalry between one another. But we shouldn't do that. When any church that believes in Jesus Christ and proclaims the word of God is doing well, that is good news for all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. So Paul is celebrating in the way that the gospel is flowering in places where he never put seeds and where he never watered. So what does this passage mean for us today? Well, it means that we are a part of that rippling effect of the gospel going out into all the world. You know, if, if that wasn't God's plan or mission, I doubt that we would know about Jesus Christ today. Um, and so we see that the church is growing in places that even we have never thought of or, or heard of before. There, there are so many little countries and cities and pockets of, of this world that unless you really love to study your globe, <laughs> you know, there, there are so many places uh, that, that we wouldn't have imagined of that the church is doing quite well. In fact, it does seem that the church is doing better outside the United States than it is doing inside the United States. And we should be happy for these other places. So how does this passage help me? Well, it's a reminder that the, the fate of the world does not rest on our shoulders. And so regardless of our effectiveness, Jesus will grow his church and rescue the world. 
and uh, and maybe I, I feel this a little bit more as as a pastor of you know that like, we got to do something we gotta we gotta make something happen and and feel like oh if if I don't do my job they like the church is gonna fall apart well no friends you know the church is not about me the the church is not about you the church is about Jesus Christ it's about the Holy Spirit and you know God will always preserve a remnant He will always make sure that that His church is advancing and, and bringing the good news of the gospel into new places. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't try? No. Uh, it, it means that we should serve, but when we serve, it's out of gratitude, not guilt. And this is good because joy is a far better motivator than guilt. You, know, you can get somebody to move quickly for a little bit with guilt, but if you want to get someone to, to move over the long haul, Joy is the better motivator. So we see this is, this is joy for the advancement of the gospel. And what would the application of this verse look like in my life? Well, it's finding stories of the church around the globe and, uh, and letting God's grace in their lives bring joy to my own life. And so if, if Paul is being encouraged by other believers, then let's see what are other believers doing. And maybe it could be, you looking at local churches that that are doing well and and celebrating with them, but I'm thinking particularly of the of the global church, and and so this leads into to my response here is was me looking into some more research on wh- where are places that the the Church of Jesus Christ is doing well that it should be an encouragement to us. And so I came across a 2020 article by Christianity Today that was reporting on a demographic study that, that says, um, it, it says that in Iran, that 1.5% of the people identify themselves as Christians. And, uh, and, and that, that was kind of a, it gave some substance to the idea that Christianity is growing in in a very strictly Muslim nation like Iran, and uh, and if if that 1.5 percent, if if that is an accurate representation of the entire nation, then that means that they are close to having one million believers in a strictly Muslim nation, and so that's good news. The gospel is growing in even difficult places. Um, we also see that in in Iran, the government is attempting to silence Christian leaders. Uh, but they find that this is very difficult because the church is growing through the efforts of ordinary people. And this makes me think of, of what we were talking about yesterday morning with Acts chapter 4, that when the church of Jesus Christ is built on the shoulders of ordinary people, then what can the world do to stop it? Because if we're looking to one particular person, let's, let's just say, you know, like sometimes what we'll see is is these great big mega churches where you have people that they love the personality of, of one unique individual, but you know maybe that person uh, they retire, and they move on. Uh, maybe that person has a, a tragedy of of faith where either they slip into sin, or sometimes you have these leaders who say, you know, I uh, I'm not doing this whole Jesus thing anymore. And when everyone puts their, their, their hope into one person and that one person's not Jesus Christ, the consequences are devastating. But if the church is not built on one person, like the Apostle Paul, but it's built on ordinary people, that's how the church starts growing up in places that Paul never went to. That's how churches are growing in places like China or in Iran or in other places. And I strongly believe that that's what's going to help the church in the United States to grow. Just think about that. We, we, we live in a time right now where we have more celebrity pastors than we've ever had before. If you want to look to you know, these big, bright, bold, amazing people, they just have a way with words. If you want to look to them. like We have so many incredible, eloquent people and the, the opportunity for their particular message to get out into all the world. And yet, the more celebrity pastors we have, the less effective the church seems to be. Because God loves to choose those who are weak, those who are small, those who are seen as, as fools or despised by the world. Like that's, that's who God loves to choose and use. And so my friends, 
let's, let's be encouraged by what we see happening in other places in the world. And let's give God the glory for that. And we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that the church is yours. It is not ours. And we are so delighted to hear how the gospel is effective, how it is transformational, even in some of the most difficult places. But Father, help us to acknowledge that our own country is becoming a difficult place. And, and not yet be, because of the persecution. Uh, that's, not, that's not really what's stopping the church right now. It's our affluence. It's our complacency that ha- is making it difficult. So let us learn from our brothers and sisters around the world that we would have the joy and the confidence that they would have. That we who are ordinary people would be advocates for your kingdom's sake. Father, we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you, my friends. Have a wonderful day.